1938, and on the Clydeside stocks is the new Cunada, number 552, destined to become the Queen Elizabeth. 1,031 feet long, the largest liner in the world. To every one of the 5,000 men who built her, she represented a personal triumph. A ship to uphold our maritime tradition, a memorial to the prowess of Britain's shipbuilders. But the triumphs of the 552 were not to be easily won on the Atlantic crossing. The time of her launching was a time of crisis. Munich was upon us. The world was on the brink of war. With affairs of state heavy upon him, His Majesty was unable to attend the launching, but the Queen and the two princesses were there, and 300,000 voices were raised in a real Clydeside welcome. expressing her regret that His Majesty was unable to be present, spoke to her vast audience in these words. I have, however, a message for you from the King. He bids the people of this country to be of good cheer, in spite of the dark clouds hanging over them, and indeed over the whole world. He knows well that as ever before in critical times, they will keep cool heads and brave hearts. He knows too that they will place entire confidence in their leaders who under God's providence are striving their utmost to find a just and peaceful solution of the grave problems which confront them. The ship began to move before Her Majesty had had time to name her. Name her Queen Elizabeth. So the ship that was launched under the shadow of war started on the first stage of her career. like the inception of all great human enterprises, an act of faith. We cannot foretell the future, but in preparing for it, we show our trust in a divine providence and in ourselves. We proclaim our belief that by the grace of God and by man's patience and goodwill, order may yet be brought out of confusion and peace out of turmoil. With that hope and prayer in our hearts, we send forth upon her mission this noble ship. On that day in 1938, many people must have wondered, was the Queen Elizabeth to take her place as the greatest of all peacetime liners, or was her work to be done in the shadow of another great war? During the time of her fitting out, the international outlook had become brighter. But as the time for her maiden voyage approached, the situation became grim again. This time, it was inevitable. Just as Britain's manhood changed from civvies to uniform and sailed away in the service of their country, so the QE donned war paint and one grey Scottish morning in 940 slipped out of her berth unescorted and set sail for the then peaceful New World. It was a race against the U-boats and she won it, her great speed outstripping the submarine. Listen to an American tribute taken from a newsreel of that time. The end of the most dramatic maiden voyage a ship ever made, and she's the biggest ship in the world. The British $28.5 million, 85,000 ton superliner, the Queen Elizabeth. Instead of a maiden voyage with gay colors, fluttering pennants, and festive ceremony, she's a strange giant of grim wartime gray. She made a secret wartime crossing hidden by censorship, as she steamed through waters imperiled by German mines and Nazi submarines. A mystery maiden voyage. She stops at quarantine in New York Harbor. Britain built her to be the queen of the queens of the sea. Then the war came. She's not quite complete. They painted over her name, but you still can see it. Yes, the Queen Elizabeth had accomplished her maiden voyage. But what a strange maiden voyage it had been. 
Even if she did break the transatlantic record, nobody was allowed to know it. Her speed was as secret as the voyage itself had been. But the QE was there. That was all that mattered. So she was maneuvered to the Cunard White Star Pier to take her place alongside other great ships of war and peace, the Queen Mary, the Normandy, and the Mauritania. From now on, complete secrecy shrouded the movements of the Queen Elizabeth. No mention could be made of her progress. But in November of the same year, we were allowed a brief glimpse as she slipped out of New York Harbor on her second voyage. Her destination and her mission were closely guarded secrets, but many people made their own guesses as the great gray ship steamed away into the mist of a winter's morning. Of her wartime trips, nothing more was heard. But when the war in Europe was over, the QE's movements again became public property. The day she sailed from Southampton for the first time was probably the greatest occasion of her career. This time, the bands did play, the people did cheer, and Commodore Sir James Bissett talked of his great commands to the movie tone microphone. I've been four years, a little over, in the Queen's, most of the time in the Queen Mary. And during that time, we've carried about a million and a quarter troops to various parts of the world. I must say that in all that time, we have never encountered a submarine or been attacked from the air. And although we had about 70 guns on board each ship, we never had occasion to fire them in anger. The passenger list was made up of 15,000 returning GIs. At this time, the Queen Elizabeth was still on war service, and she still carried aboard souvenirs of the servicemen she had transported all over the world. So from Southampton, the Queen Elizabeth leaves on what, from the ceremonial point of view, was the nearest approach to a maiden voyage she had ever known. Yes, there's no doubt about it, the QE's first visit to Southampton was a great occasion. War was over, the GIs were going home to their families at last, and though England was sorry to say farewell to these cheery ambassadors of the New World, she was glad for their sakes that they were homeward bound. No wonder it was such a happy affair, even the RAF took time off to celebrate. Yes, it was peace, or rather the transitional period between peace and war. And when the greatest warship in the world, HMS Vanguard, left the Clyde on her trials, she passed the greatest of the ships of peace, undergoing the change from the dull grey of war for the brighter colours of passenger service. From there, the QE went back to Southampton for further attention. great dry dock, final preparations were made before her demobilization and handing back to the Cunard White Star Line. The fittings, which had been stripped for war, were replaced. Not only is she the largest liner in the world, but also the most comfortable. the QE was ready for her speed trials, and what's more, her royal speed trials, for the Queen herself was to sail in her. Accompanied by the two princesses, the Queen took a lively interest in all around her. Princess Elizabeth, by the way, apparently decided to check the official figures. At 
long last, the Queen Elizabeth was a passenger liner undergoing speed trials like any other great ship of our time. No longer are her comings and goings a matter of concern to the censors. The stage was all set for her true maiden voyage. Her Majesty left the ship after her trip, she turned to wave good luck and Godspeed to the world's greatest liner. And reconverted from grim transport to luxury liner, the Queen Elizabeth reverts to her original destiny. At Southampton, she's boarded by civilians and notables. There's United States Senator Conley, Soviet Foreign Minister V.M. Molotov, Former Australian Commissioner to Britain, S.M. Bruce. Entertainment world celebrities like Geraldo and his charming wife. Sir A.P. Herbert, parliamentarian and author. Jack Hilton, impresario. And she starts her career as the largest passenger liner afloat. British judge at Nuremberg, Sir Norman Burkett and his lady are making the maiden voyage, as is American-born English stage favorite Evelyn Dahl, there's motor magnate Sir William Root. Happy contrast to furtive war sailings is this gala and enthusiastic gathering of well-wishers. To their cheers, the big ship leaves her berth, with the lucky passengers waving their farewells. On the bridge, Commodore Sir James Bissett directs the departure. view discloses the overall majesty of the liner with her streamlined beauty apparent from all angles as the snub-nosed terriers of port slowly push her huge hulk from the dock. And now leaving the pier, funnels indicate she's ready for her own power. Underway she is, symbol of Britain's determination to maintain her position as the world's greatest maritime nation. Movie Tone News' camera aboard reveals the activities of the maiden voyage, catching officers charting the course and radar busily using its bewildering powers. Russia's delegation to the United Nations and Messrs. Molotov and Vyshinsky pose for a close-up. At a press conference, the movie tone camera finds such notables as Sir Hartley Shawcross, Britain's prosecutor at Nuremberg. Jan Masaryk, leader of the Czechoslovakian UN delegation. And Senator Conley, returning from the big peace conference at Paris. The Queen's spacious decks are ideal for sport. Deck tennis is particularly popular, with the fair sex active participants. In a male quartet enjoying a game, our movie tone camera finds Viscount Rothermere, youthful publisher of the Daily Mail with coat on, foregoing the cares and worries of journalism. Shuffleboard has its followers with the deck fairways constantly in use. Under the watchful eye of the skipper, Mr. Molotov now takes the wheel. How does she compare with the ship of state, Mr. M? And now, good omen, the port with Dawn and New York Bay. New York's incredible masonry still sleeping, but the harbor set for a rousing welcome. An 
another view of the famous skyline. Port fireboats spume watery geysers of welcome to the great ship, to the enjoyment of the travelers. With ferry boat like ease, the queen comes to dock, though in new dress, no stranger. From this same berth, she carried thousands of fighting men to the battlefields of World War II. With Mrs. Connolly, the senator reports on Paris. We're glad to be back on United States soil. We have just come from the Paris Peace Conference. Though the conference did not achieve all that we desired, it was substantial in its results. Andrei Gromyko, center, Russia's Security Council delegate, is on hand to greet Mr. Molotov, who tells Movie Tone News he is sure the problems before the United Nations can be solved, given goodwill and a sincere desire to achieve mutual understanding. And to a long list, add another triumph for the Queen Elizabeth.